So this is called, I change not, not. You know, when someone says, I'll do that for you, not. (laughs) Down in the States, they have this thing that always throws me because it's obviously they're used to it. And they'll say, I'll say, can, can, do you have this? And they'll say, sure, don't. (laughs) And when they said, sure, I was sure it was going to be sure do because I'm only used to sure do up here or sure can but I'm not used to sure don't. And so they kind of send me a, uh, you know, so this is, I change not, not. I change not, not. Even though that message technically won't end up being correct, I'm using that title to realize what people think about God and how he doesn't change is not about God not changing, it's usually about us not changing and we try to put God into his box and he's saying don't box me in. Don't fence me in. So um, I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures to begin with to set the background. It says, for I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3 and 6. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. Hebrews 13. Every good and perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is, stop there, here's where I'm going for, no variation, neither shadow of turning. There's not even a shadow of turning. James chapter 1. In Numbers chapter 23, God is not human. It says, God is not human, that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. See, we can get locked into those scriptures, but God's not changing his mind. But he is changing what you think his mind is. What you often think, this is what the mind of the Lord is. No, you'll find he doesn't have the same mind on a lot of things that you have. He, in his vision and majesty and fullness, is quite secure in who he is. But when we take these pieces and think this is who God is, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Rhetorical? No, he does speak and he does act. However, he takes a while. That's why he put these annoying verses in there. Oh, by the way, Brian, a day with me is like a thousand years. Oh, good Lord. (laughs) How many things am I going to see done? (laughs) Does he promise and not fulfill? It's rhetorical. and Yes, he does. If he promises, he'll fulfill. But God, I'm 90. I don't have any kids. God, I can't have any kids. Sarah is a prune. But God. And the Bible says God put the juices back into Sarah. You read your Bible. The Bible said God put the juices back into Sarah and the fire back into Abraham. And that's what she said. She didn't say, oh no, now I've got to have a baby. She said... Do I get pleasure with my Lord again? That meant they loved each other. God is consistent. But he appears to change because we see through a dark glass. God is consistent. But some things look different because we're seen through a dark glass. Tinted windows. Or as it says, in part, we see in part. And sometimes we think our in part is in whole. And our in part is in part. And it's also in part in a certain season, in a certain generation, in a a certain context. Now I know in part. So you know in part. I know in part. But the part we don't know, God is who He knows He is. But not necessarily who you know think he is 
We, mankind, Christians, try to box God in, make Him the same. Why? Because we're comfortable when He's the same to us. When we have the God rules. God, the God I'm comfortable with. He says, I change not, but not. See, the first I change not is true to Him, but the second not is to you. It's not what you think he means when he says, I change not. It's not what you think it means and it's not what I think it means. Because I see a part. I see through tinted windows. Somebody pointed out and I never knew it until I watched a Perot movie. A little guy goes around solving murders. Something about my wife and I, we love watching people get murdered. But you never actually do see yourself all the days you're alive because when you see yourself in a mirror, you're actually seeing a reverse image of yourself. If you see yourself in the water, you're seeing a reverse. So when you think your right eye's drooping, you may be able to figure out it's your right, but in the mirror, it'll appear opposite. Now, Mr. Perot figured that out and solved a whole murder just knowing that secret. <laughs> so I'm ready. <laughs> I change not. In Genesis chapter 1, let me ask you if this sounds like a change. See, people want to define the Old Testament God different than the New Testament God. No. See if Genesis chapter 1, when we have this God who recreates, and of course Genesis 1 and 2 is is recreated, not created. First verse is created. Verse 2 is recreated. The God of Genesis 1 who recreated a world a whole universe for a couple of people. And why did he do it? He said, because I want you to grow a family. He said that before the fall. And why, why am I doing that? So we could walk together and talk together. So God, before man made changes, did the best he could do, created this universe, put the best things. And then the Bible says... Uh, the, the God of Genesis chapter 1 came down himself on this beautiful earth and actually planted a garden on the earth. And when he planted that garden, that garden, the Bible tells us, is a spiritual garden on the earth. So it's partly natural, the garden, and it's also partly spiritual. That's why they had to get them out of the garden because they had to get them out of the garden because it was a spiritual place that they no longer belonged in. But it says that God himself built a garden But he'd already created a beautiful world with no weeds. He'd already recreated a beautiful universe. And he created it all so that he could walk with a couple of people and tell them to go ahead and have more people because there's more people I want to talk with in this beautiful garden. How consistent is that, God, to the God who John 3.16 says, who gives himself through giving his son That's pretty consistent God in Genesis chapter 1. He did his best, created his best, made a beautiful place, created actually sons of God, a son of God and a daughter of God, which together became the son of God together. And then when that gift didn't work, he sent another gift, clearly better than the garden, but it's consistent with this God and how he thinks who's not changing. God does not change who God is, but man changes who he is. When man changes who he is, he puts God in a position that God was not looking forward to be in. He can be in that position. But he wasn't really looking forward to it, nor did he really plan to be in it, even though he knew he would have to be. Why? Because he saw his seed grow. And he still loved his seed even though they decided they go the wrong way. So just as Eve is leaving the garden, he says, honey, remember this, I'm going to use you. Bless the world as a woman. It's going to cost you something now, but I'm going to use you to bless the world and I'm going to use you to stomp on the devil. 
See? Because he didn't give up on his dream. Because in that garden, God gives a greater gift, even than the garden. He gives this gift called choice. We call it free will. He gives this great gift above the great gift that's in the garden to two people that he just created who looked fantastic. One time I was in Hawaii and I looked over at the beach and I said to the person with me, I said, do you see those two people? I've never, I mean, you all look good. Say, I think so. <laughs> you say, well, pastor, I don't want to lie. No, you're talking by faith right now. Amen. 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 And you've done the best you could do today. Come on. You brushed your teeth, put on a little bit of eyeshadow. <laughs> Did your best. I looked over at this couple and I said, do you see that couple over there? I've never seen two people and I never have since. Whether God was giving me a vision, I have no idea. And they were playing with a child. And I looked at them and all I could say is that was how Adam and Eve looked. They were just like this family sitting on the beach in Hawaii, which is pretty close to the garden. Enjoying each other, enjoying their child. And I couldn't get my eyes off them because I thought, wow, what it must have been like with what God started with. And then he gives us free will because without free will, we can't be like him. And he decided to make us like him so that we could talk to him like he could talk to us. So he gives us this other great gift called Choice, free will, the opportunity to be a separate person from God and to each other. See, my free will gives me the choice to be separate from you. Your free will gives you the choice. Don't believe me? Just go to a restaurant, ask for the menu, see if there's different choices. If people didn't make different choices, there'd be one choice. Because restaurants would only cook what you want. But a lot of people want a lot of different stuff. Is that consistent, that person back in Genesis 1 with John 3.16, where again, choice returns. He tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We already dealt with that. That whoever chooses to believe gets back what was taken. Free choice took us out. Free choice brings us in. Amen. That's why you give people the gospel. Not to get them saved. You want them saved. You've got to love them. But you get them the gospel so they get to make a choice. Without somebody telling them there's a great God and his name is Jesus and he cared for you and he died for you, it's very difficult to make a choice. And he gave us that great gift. God has not changed. We changed. Man change. Man changes things through his choices. My message is about the spirit of change and the spirit of changes. It is the Holy Ghost that left man naked. It's the Holy Ghost that left man naked. They were in the garden walking so much with the Holy Ghost they didn't even know the Holy Ghost was walking with them. They thought the Holy Ghost was them and he was them. He was clothing them and they didn't really know they were being clothed until they discovered they were naked. And the minute they discovered they were naked, they got afraid. But they were never afraid before. And they got afraid because they made a choice. And they made a choice not to listen to directions. And because they made a choice not to listen to directions, fear came in. And then fear begins to stir everything up. But the Holy Ghost left the second they made that choice. Jesus and Father God in Christ came to walk with them. But the Holy Spirit had already left them. Then the Holy Spirit comes again when we call on the name of Jesus. And the Bible says he closes the, puts clothes on us. It's the robe of righteousness. He closes, puts the clothes, and the clothes on us is called Christ. I am clothed with Christ. It is no longer I that lives, 
according to the Bible and according to the Spirit. What made the difference? I changed. God didn't change. I changed. I quit saying, no, 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 I don't want to go, go, go. I want to do my thing, thing, thing. And nobody does their own thing. You either do God's thing and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, or you do what's called your thing until you get to the end of the life and you realize that you've been deceived. I change not. Don't box God in. The Holy Spirit is change. In the middle of a God who changes not, everything the Holy Spirit has changed. That's why people don't understand Him and you can understand Him because He keeps changing. Because in the sameness of God and the no change of God, Holy Ghost is always changing because Holy Ghost knows I need different things on different days. And He's prepared. I change not. Not. God says, don't box me in, in your mind. The Holy Ghost is change. As the need requires, His change makes Him the same. The fact that He changes makes the Holy Spirit the same. So the Holy Spirit is the same. He's the same as He ever has been. But as being the same, what's the same about you, Holy Spirit? I change. That's what the same is. He's a wind to separate the Red Sea. Or He's a wind to fill an upper room. He is a fire to burn the water-logged wood that Elijah had put down. And not only did the fire burn the water-logged wood, all the sacrifices, it also burned up a whole lot of stones. And that was the Holy Ghost, the fire of God that came from heaven. And then the Holy Ghost is fire that set upon every one of their heads, including Mary, in the upper room. And then... Holy Ghost suddenly gives them the ability to pray in a new way. But each way is a different way. So now he says, I'm going to teach you languages. It was the Holy Ghost who confounded the one language of the world. That was the only judgment. He didn't destroy anybody. He says, let's keep these people from talking to each other. And from then on, you'll see the problems were always with each other. So people never came against God in the same way after that. And now God does the opposite to the miracle of the Tower of Babel. And he gives one language, even though it manifests itself in different languages. So many different languages. The Bible says there's not enough languages on the earth to talk the way the Holy Ghost loves to talk. So the Holy Ghost says, I will also use the angels' languages. And if we didn't know that Bible verse, we wouldn't have even known angels have different languages. We would have thought they all spoke English. <laughs> Not. He is the Spirit of God. He's the seven spirits of God. He's the Spirit of God. He's the seven spirits of God. He's the Spirit of God. He's the seven spirits of God. He, she, which he's both, he's referred to as both, is the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, he gives gifts of the Spirit, then explains, by the way, all these gifts I just gave you, which are a whole bunch of different gifts, but I want you to know as soon as I give you the different gifts, when you let, let me work them with you, they're never going to operate the same. They're always going to operate differently. So every gift that I give you is going to operate differently on different days and different ways. Then it's going to operate differently through different people. Why? Because what makes me the same is that I'm never the same. And we could have gone into water. We could have, how he manifests himself as water. In 1 Corinthians, he gives the gifts of the Spirit and explains they work differently. Differently, different gifts, same spirit. Differences of ministrations, same Lord. Differences of operations, same God working all in all. Same God at work, changing things, but he's not changing, but he's changing things. In Genesis, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the earth, and then he appears 
as he hovers over the earth in Genesis, he also appears to hover over Jesus as a dove. But he's not a bird. Say it, Holy Ghost is not a bird. And he's not a fire. And he's not a wind. And he's not a language. He's a person who likes to stir things up. Wisdom is the principal thing, the Bible says. Therefore, get wisdom. If it's the principal thing, get wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says. Proverbs 8 says, does not will that wisdom speak. The Bible says it cries out. Then it says wisdom is a she. Don't get too excited, ladies. (laughs) Here it's the Holy Spirit connecting himself to the she. She stands at the top of the high places. Hear from and I will hear for hear for I will speak of excellent things. That's what wisdom will do. Wisdom, not fear. Fear will tell you don't do this, don't do that. Wisdom will say, I got great and mighty things. Amen. Greater things will you do. He's exceedingly abundantly, even though none of us have even got to abundantly. We've been blessed. A lot of us blessed. Not a lot of us got to abundantly. Hardly any have got to exceedingly abundantly. And then we move on to... All. So turn to somebody and say, Boy, I got things to do. I got places to go. My mouth shall speak truth. And then it says this about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 11. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him the Spirit of wisdom. Who is the Spirit? See, when you're born again, the Spirit comes in you, but then the Holy Spirit comes on you for purposes. The Holy Spirit comes out of you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but He comes on you for assignments. The Holy Spirit is fully God, but a secondary. Now listen to this, because I hope to blow your little Christian minds. (laughs) The Holy Spirit is fully God, but a secondary spirit to you, in you. This is the amazing thing. The Holy Spirit, who is God, chooses not to operate like God, but He's there to to help you learn to operate like God, but if you choose to operate like you, or even the devil, he keeps quiet and lets you do your thing because even though he came into you, he did not come into you to rule you. He came into you to reveal the ruler to you. And the second, he's a secondary spirit in you. The Holy Spirit reflects God's plans, but yields to yours. He keeps showing you, this is what God has for you. Look at what the Bible says. Look at these experiences. Look at that testimony. Look at, look at, look, Holy Ghost. But then you say, no, that's not for me. I'm not good enough. If you only knew, he knew what you did. He knows where you've been. He can't remember the sins because he can't see through Jesus. Holy Spirit himself uses the gift that God gave him, the Father. God uses a gift called seeing you through Jesus. The Holy Spirit will convict you. He can see your sin, but he still does not see your sin as your definition. He sees Christ in you as your definition. He sees the sin in you as the hindrance to his vision. The Holy Spirit is not in control of us even though he birthed you in the spirit. Our spirit of free will is still in operation and the Holy Spirit respects that gift so much. The Holy Spirit is available to us as wisdom. He cries out to us. The Holy Spirit will remain true to God's will. The Holy Spirit will remain true to God's will. The Holy Spirit will remain true to God's will and God's word but will operate in a great area of grace towards you while he's trying to get you to the finish line. Or get somebody to death. Remember when the Bible says, in him I live and move and have my, our being. That is not talking to the Christian. 
Every person in the world is in the Spirit. They just don't have the Spirit in them. Every person in the world the Spirit is working on. Something scary one day is going to happen. The Holy Spirit will be lifted. He will still be here to save people. He will go back more into a way things were in the Old Testament. And this great season of grace that poured out on us will be withdrawn for a short period of time. And my own personal hope is that I'm not here to see it. For even people who are mean will become stronger in their meanness. For the restraining power of the Holy Spirit will be removed to, for man to fulfill his choices. The Holy Spirit is available to us as wisdom. She cries out to the Holy Spirit will remain true to God's will and word but will operate in a great grace to include you and I as we walk in our will. He'll put up with your will as you're walking in your will because he's believing you're going to return to his will. Because he knows to get back to your garden, you got to come back the way you got out. You got to come back choosing the Lord. Not for salvation, but for life living. The Holy Spirit is a collaborative partner for us. This is what Jesus was teaching. Holy Spirit did not run Jesus' life. Jesus ran his own life. He was a collaborator. He was a, a partner. And sometimes you could almost argue that he's a silent partner because sometimes he chooses not to speak while he's asking you to believe. Why? Because he knows if he can get you to believe, then you won't be re as reliant on the things you hear from him. And he wants you to get to know, and that we're going to find this when we get there, the secret of the Holy Spirit is his purpose is to get you to see Jesus. And so therefore, he'll be anything he has to be. He'll indirectly direct your paths. You say, how did God direct me over here? I didn't even know God was leading me. The internal Holy Spirit. Or even people are not Christians, the external Holy Spirit, for in Him we live and move and have our being. And He's trying to get you to meet someone that's going to witness. He's going to try to get you to hear something. Why? Because this Holy Spirit doesn't need to be seen because He's here to reveal somebody else. And He is revealed through Christ. So you're going to get to know Him through Christ so he is interested in you getting to know Christ so that Christ can turn around and reveal him to you. So that not only does Jesus become the one you're walking with, so is his fellow spirit and collaborator, the Holy Spirit. Guiding us unconsciously, he does it. Speaking to us in multiple ways through many people and many things. Holy Spirit, what do you do? Don't box me in. Listen to the seven-year-old. Listen to the 77-year-old. Listen to people you don't really like. Listen, listen, listen. I will use. See, see, see. The Bible uses 66 books. A whole lot of authors with all different styles. The book's all written differently. However, it's the same writer. The same writer decides, I'm going to have fun today. I mean, I, if, I, if I was the Holy Ghost, there's no way I'm writing the Song of Solomon. I just passed that whole thing. But he wrote it because he loves women. For men, maybe, you know, for, for men, I think he wrote First Kings and Second Kings and anything where people are killing people. <laughs> Many styles, but it's the same spirit for different seasons. The Holy Spirit does not accept, expect the same of David in his season in history that he expects of you in your season of history. Don't go out and get married five or six times to, and at the same time and think Holy Ghost will be happy about that. David could get away with it. Solomon pushed the envelope. However, 
the National Enquirer greatly exaggerated. He was not married to a thousand women. He was only married to 330 some. Remember that. <laughs> However, he did have visiting rights to another 600 and some. And as I say, in those days, the way they differentiated them was the 333 got the gold card and the other ones got the silver or your regular visa. That might not be in the Bible, but you spend some time looking for it. It won't hurt you. As we go to John chapter 14, uh, no, sorry, we're not going to go there. John chapter 14, sorry. In chapter 14, verse 16, he says, there's another comforter, say another comforter to Jesus. And Jesus says, he's an answer to Jesus, this other comforter. He's an answer to Jesus' prayer. It says this other comforter, though he's an answer to Jesus' prayer, is actually a gift from the Father. Verse 17 says, who is he? He's the spirit of truth. Not telling the truth. He wants you to tell the truth, but truth is bigger than telling the truth. It's like Christians, they forget. They're so busy with the sins of commission. Oh, I did this wrong. The ones you need to be concerned about are the sins of omission. We need to be concerned about what God has asked us to do and we have not done. Maybe even more so than what you've done. Because with something you've done, there is a blood that will cover the sins that you've done. There is no blood that I know of. And maybe there is. Lord, forgive me for all the things I didn't do. That you told me to do. That you showed me to do. Well, that might work for you. Verse 27, John 15, 26. He will testify me. This Holy Spirit will tell people about me, Jesus said. If he's telling you about me, and you know one of the greatest secrets he was telling them about Jesus is how Jesus worked with the Holy Ghost. Jesus' secret was that Jesus collaborated with the Holy Ghost. So all the times Jesus didn't know what to do, our singers can come now, all the time that Jesus didn't know what to do, he needed his collaborator to get him there. Sometimes he didn't even know where he was going. He would just turn up at the right place, just like you and I do. Other times he'd say, you need to go over here. Verse 27. Jesus is the key to the Holy Spirit's work and heart. Jesus is the key to the Holy Spirit's work. Holy Spirit's number one work is to show us Jesus. To get us saved if we don't know Christ, and then to show us Christ if we're saved. It's the one priority that doesn't change for him, but he will change a hundred things or a thousand things to get to you, to show you how to get to him. And then it goes on in verse 27 that you also must testify. We're just going to turn on the scripture now to John chapter 16, verse 7 to 12. We're not going to go into all these things, but he's telling, Jesus is telling us why he's sending the Holy Ghost. And he said, but I tell you the truth, it is, it's a good thing for you that I'm going away. Now, I don't think it is. But Jesus said it was. So Jesus was telling the truth, and I'm not. Because I think it would be a whole lot easier if there was a physical Jesus. He'd get all our miracles done. He'd tell us every time, even if he had to tell me, hey, lack of faith guy, hey. You know, that would seem a whole lot easier. But Jesus says to get the thing done I want done, I can't afford to be with everybody everywhere. So to get the thing I want done, I'm sending this person, male, female, neither, both, I'm sending this person who'll do everything he can, move everything he can, come in every way he needs to, to show you Jesus. Basically in John chapter 16, verse 12, it says this. 
he has ma- I have many things to say to you. Jesus said, boys, I've got a lot to say. Holy Spirit, we stop right now. And I believe that I need to hear things from Jesus. I believe there's not a person in this place that doesn't need to hear more things from Jesus. And Jesus said that he had things he wanted to say to me. And I want you to know the things he's going to say to me are, are going to often be different. They're going to be consistent to the word, but different to what he says to me. Because the Holy Spirit is not saying the same thing to each of us because we have different places within his influence under Christ's authority as head of the church. And then he says, the things I'm going to say to you, in verse 12, he says, you're going to need my help to even be able to handle it. Because I'm going to ask you to do things that you're going to say, I can't do that. Well, don't worry. The Holy Spirit's not just going to tell you. He's going to help you do it. Amen. He's going to help. He's going to lift the heavy end of the boat. He's going to get you to the right people that will have the right information. Verse 13 to 15. And we're just going to read verse 15. We'll go right to verse 15. All that belongs to the Father is mine, says Jesus. All. Wow. That is why I said the Spirit will take what is mine. All that my Father has is mine, Jesus said. It's not Brian's, only by faith. But by ownership, all the... Jesus had, all the the Father had was Jesus's. And therefore Jesus said, that is why, this is the reason I'm saying this to you, that the Spirit is here to do whatever he needs to do in whatever matter, do not box the Spirit in. I said the Spirit will take from what is mine, and everything that's mine is the Father's, And he will make it known to you. So the first thing the Spirit's going to do is he's going to start showing you what's possible. Let me go back to that video. If it's not that video, grab something else that seems bigger than what you think is possible. Grab something bigger. Well, boy, I don't think I would have faith to do that. Read a book about somebody who did something big. So you could read a book and say, I don't think that I could ever do that. But then as you're reading the book, you'll find out that they never thought they could do that. And the Holy Spirit is first of all to tell you that that's possible then he's here to blow on you, turn you on fire, wash you with the word, take you up into the third heaven if it needs to be. Man, that must have been a mini vacation. (laughs) Why? Because after he makes it known, he wants to make you know it. So I can't get saved until I know that anybody here today and you don't know for sure Jesus exists you've got nothing to lose if he doesn't exist ask him Jesus if you do exist I sure would like to get to know you would you come into my heart if he doesn't exist nothing's going to happen however if you open the door enough and say wow if you do exist and I think there's a 50, 50, 30, 70 chance that you do then I'm going to invite you at my level But see, at some point you have to see that there's a lot of other nutty people in this place. And some of them even think Jesus lives in them. And some of them even think that they would be dead if it wasn't for Jesus. And there's some of these people that even think God has turned their lives around and helped their families. There's some of these nuts in this place think that God has helped them pay their bills. That, That God has done all sorts of things. You are surrounded by a crazy group. We want to welcome you to the crowd. 
We want you to be greater in your imagination of the possibilities. I want, that's why I'm, I'm blessed that Nathan is taking a song and adding to it. I'm blessed the last Sunday night, I think it was Sunday night, Nathan gets up and speaks. And as he's speaking, the Holy Ghost comes on. I'm blessed that Jay gets up and speaks. I'm blessed that people come to the altar. Why? Because when you come, you begin to see something. Now you've seen it. You've come to the altar. Now you've got to take the fire, the rain, the seven spirits, whatever he says you need, and say, now that I see I can be free from my care, teach me. Help me. Comfort me. Train me. So that eventually I'll wake up and say, wow, I never thought that could be possible. You have to see what's bigger than what you think is possible. So we're going to, they're coming right back now. We're going to sing this song. If you need to go, you certainly can go. But we're going to sing. What's the key words to those last words? Uh, We open up and let you in. in. Man, there's a good altar call. We open up and let you in. Well, who are we letting in? Well, if, if you're saved, you got Jesus in. Yeah. If you're not saved, ask Jesus in. Yeah. Come and tell us. Coach's Corner's up here. These are nice people at the front. We only let the nice ones come to the front. <laughs> and these nice people, you need to come and tell them that you asked Jesus in your heart. Why? Because we want to get you going. We want to get you help. Amen. Amen? So, But the rest of us, what we're saying is, Holy Ghost, will you come in here and push, help me push some more of me out? Can you help me let go and learn how to hang on? Can you, Holy Spirit, can you come and show me what you see in me so that I can begin to see you clearer? Because Holy Ghost is here to show me his wonderful Jesus.